everyone, it's Daniel Elwood and Robert Johnson, The Last Nighters, and The Last Nighters can be found on The Launchpad Media, where they're always launching new ideas in your direction. Check it out at thelaunchpadmedia.com. This is episode 102 of the show, and we'll be talking about Christmas movie Gremlins with our special guest, Rocky Ferenberg. He's been a guest with us a couple of times in the past. He was here with us about a year ago for Smallfoot and just a few short months ago for the Clint Eastwood flick, The Mule. And uh, he is driving right now. So this might be a little bit of a uh, awkward <laughs> interview with him or guest appearance. But he is being the mule right now, uh, working and driving and doing this show all at the same time. Welcome to the show, Rocky Ferenberg. This is uh, lastnighters.com slash 102 is the show notes for more. Rocky, can, can you hear us uh, in between all the shifting and the clutching and the... <laughs> Yeah, don't don't compare what what I do to that god awful movie. <laughs> yeah, now is that a foreign vehicle you're driving, or are you going to be, I don't know, problematically um, xenophobic regarding <laughs> yeah. the equipment you're using? Yeah, this whole time I'm going to do nothing but swear and use racial slurs. Well, that's that's why we have movies like this. <laughs> it's. Um, you know, it's kind of funny because this this movie and watching it uh, last night, I was like, wow, you know, a lot of this is probably you couldn't make some of these things today. You couldn't do some of these things today, which seemed a little, uh, no. a little odd. I mean, this was kind of a kid's movie um, until I realized how how violent it is. And it's definitely not a movie I'm going to let my kids watch anytime soon. But uh, no, before... it, it... Oh, no, go, go ahead. ahead. Ladies first, you Rocky, go for it. <laughs> I was just gonna say it has this it has this trifecta of uh, of um, comedy, horror, and holiday all kind of wrapped into one delicious treat. Right. Yeah. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to do this is because it's nearly the holiday, or it's the holiday period right now. And I saw a Facebook post that you had made recently comparing Die Hard and Gremlin and asking which one was more Christmas themed. And I think you came down on the side of Gremlins. And I, I want you to, on this episode, defend your thesis because I'm pretty hard in the uh, welcome to the party pal camp. Well, I'll tell you what, man, like I, like I, tell, like I tell everybody, uh, Die Hard is a Christmas movie. So if you don't think Die Hard is a Christmas movie, you're absurdly wrong. But Die Hard is just not the best Christmas movie. Uh, and my, my actual real uh, argument is that Die Hard is not even as good of a Christmas movie as Jingle All the Way with Sinbad and Schwarzenegger. But the best Christmas movie that has ever been made is Gremlins. All right, that's a bold statement. And uh, <laughs> we will get uh, you to defend that shortly here. Uh, we usually start off with the Google description. So I will do that to kick us off. And then we'll go to Robert for his initial reaction. And, uh, you know, feel free to take any digs at our guests there, Robert. I will be. Don't worry. <laughs> All right. So Gremlins, uh, it says 1984 fantasy horror film, one hour, 47 minutes, 7.3 IMDb, 84% Rotten Tomatoes and 70% Metacritic. However, 86% of Google users like it. The description is a gadget salesman is looking for a special gift for his son and finds one at the store in Chinatown. The shopkeeper is reluctant to sell him the Mogwai, but sells it to him with the warning to never expose him to bright light, water or to feed him after midnight. All of this happens, and the result is a gang of gremlins that decide to tear up the town on Christmas Eve. Uh, it says release date of August 30th, 1985. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm unclear whether this is an 84 movie or an 85. Uh, the director is Joe Dante, and he has all sorts of like little um, nods and winks and stuff to memorabilia and uh, prior movie references and things like that. So it's kind of fun to see that. Uh, it was a screenplay by Chris Columbus, the guy who did some of the Harry Potter movies, and uh, it's produced by Stephen Spielberg. And Kathleen Kennedy had her talents in this uh, way back in the day, and she's still um, kicking around, throwing in the uh, feminist stuff into movies to this day. So, Robert, let's get your reaction uh, to the Google description and best uh, Yeah. So, Kathleen Kennedy, I believe, was working with Steven Spielberg quite a bit back in the day. She actually had a hand in Jurassic Park. So this was before, you know, she got the head of hold of like Lucasfilm. And I don't know what is she like the head of Disney or something like that or Disney Entertainment or something. I don't know what her official title is. But I know she's gotten worse over time. 
Uh, I didn't see a whole lot of the feminist angle stuff in this movie. I don't think she had a whole lot of influence over this film. Uh, but I I was kind of scratching my... I mean, this, this is like this cheesy 80s movie that, looking back on it, I can see why you would say it's a kid's movie. Because as an adult watching this, I'm sitting there going... What is this movie trying to do? Who's this for? <laughs> is it trying to be a... It's not scary. Is it trying to be a comedy? It's not funny. It's... <laughs> what is it just trying to tell some weird oddball story? It, the, the, the description said it was a fantasy horror movie. Um, I, I, these puppets... I, I'll grant you it's the 80s. And, you know, puppet technology has improved marginally probably but you're still probably left with this human real human interacting with a very very puppet looking puppet and pretending to be afraid of that thing i think and it just strikes me as ridiculous every time in the, the second half of the movie is all humans pretending to be afraid of these little puppets and it, the whole time you're just going, this is ridiculous. You just kick it or step on it or grab a fresh flashlight. Like, wh wh what's the danger here? Anyway, I, I, I didn't like this movie at all. So um, we'll see. I, it's very Christmas themed. You got me there, Rocky. It's very much yeah. a Christmas movie. It's mentioned repeatedly. I although I don't know who goes to school on Christmas Eve, Rocky. <laughs> hey man. <laughs> but entire apparently an entire class does. It's, like a it's whole kinda, school goes to school on Christmas Eve. Now now it was made in the eighties, like whenever the whenever the officer's car flips over and you could see the uh the, the plate underneath to to perform the stunt, because no car has a plate underneath like that. You know what I mean? So there's there's a lot of it was made in the eighties, that's definitely for sure. It's not like it was made like last year or anything. But I, I will push back on uh, on the puppets. I actually thought that the uh, in comparison to what some of the CGI, how well some some of the CGI holds up over the course of a couple of years. You go back and watch some of these movies, and the CGI is just completely trash. It doesn't even hold up, you know, four or five years. Like you kind of said, puppet uh, puppet uh, uh, technology is only increased marginally. I thought these puppets looked. Uh, more realistic than a vast majority of CGI that we have today. Well, you're not that's wrong about they, that. That's because they are real. You know what I mean? And they, that the, puppet, the puppet's freaking real. So. Right, it, right. It, but you are limited in the range of motion a puppet can do, you know, how scary a puppet is. I mean, yes. if you watch a movie like The Thing, that's puppets. But that's, oh, like, yeah. horrifying. Yeah, I watched. You know, the thing if you the grant if you grant the reality of the thing, but then you got these little gremlin things. <laughs> you can't even compare the two. These that, little gremlin the, things, they're just like, I don't know. I'd just take a run and kick at it, and it'd be flying. I I, I don't know what's scary. It's like they never got the Chucky movies either. The Chucky well, the movies ch were always like, it's a little doll. What is it gonna do? <laughs> Uh, the the whole the whole idea of gremlins though, and the reason why the gremlins works more for being kind of a comedy horror, is because gremlins are historically a more mischievous kind of uh, mythological creature. There, a lot of times, gremlins are not even really necessarily evil. Some mythos of gremlins have them just basically going out and playing pranks and getting kind of you know kind of stirring up mischief and stuff like that. So whenever you have gremlins. It, if you had a gremlin in like an actual horror movie, it's not really as scary as so much as if there's going to be a, a funny element to it. And so, of course, this direction, they just, you know, blew it over the top with the gremlin sitting there like uh, like he's a detective and they're all getting drunk and smoking cigarettes, and, you know, doing all that kind of shit. You got the, the, the girl, uh, the girl gremlin and, and whatnot. So it's uh, it's uh, definitely I think it's definitely marketed to be a, a, a comedy style horror unlike the chucky movies which originally tried to be serious and when everybody thought that they were made a joke out of them then they made it into a joke same thing with the leprechaun the first leprechaun was supposed to be scary but then you have leprechaun in the hood you know and he's like oh well, you know with ice with weed is a friend indeed you know and all these corny ass lines and stuff 
Yeah. And that well, was- you mentioned the scenes in like the bar with all the different gremlins and dressed up in different costumes and things. <laughs> and I want to say that those are probably my favorite scenes. Uh, the human element was like, eh, but the puppets interacting with other puppets were actually kind of fun. So I will grant you that. I wouldn't say it was funny, but they were kind of amusing and entertaining. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's well, then the scene I hated the most, Robert. <laughs> I think yes, it'd be the one that Daniel, I hated, hated the most. it. The thing that I liked. Good. <laughs> Did you like yeah. any of this, Daniel? Come on, out with it. Well, not not particularly. I, I have fonder <laughs> memories of this from watching it 25 years ago. Uh, it's one of those <laughs> movies that you see when you're young and then you have nostalgic memories of it. And then when you watch it again as an adult, you're like, wow, this really isn't very good. Like <laughs> the memory is way better than the real thing. And yeah. part of the reason that I hate that scene was it felt like one of those kind of corny musical montage things where they're just doing all these sight gags and costume you know funny like little nods to other things but the underlying purpose i believe of this entire film was to have a commentary a social commentary on western values and western culture of greed and profit and success and working hard and shitting on those things and saying that it leads to excess and these these gremlins were basically living hedonistic uh, consumption lifestyle, going to the bar, getting drunk, doing all this crazy shit. And I think that that was what they're trying to tell us. That's what uh, capitalism leads to. You know, they shit all over Judge Reinhold in this movie. And apparently he had a, a much larger part um, other than the, you know, scene and a half that he ended up in in the final film. But it, it certainly set up as money's bad, profit's bad, people who have money or work hard are bad people. And um, the gremlins are hedonistic and they're the excess of capitalism and they're evil. And it's only this nerdy dude who can barely ask the girl out and this little uh, Yoda, baby Yoda, fuzzball gizmo thing uh, that saves the day with the character there. I think it. I think it uh, did try to. Prom- I, I guess the guy was kind of dorky in the end, but uh, I think Rand, the inventor. I mean, the whole time you have this guy who's trying to be this this inventor, or trying to basically uh, uh, create kind of uh, or support his family off of entrepreneurial um, ideas and, and methods. And I don't think they kind of shit on him in any way that would make me think that they were trying to discourage against uh, entrepreneurship, which is kind of the heart and center of capital. Yeah, but they they made him kind of the 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 joke, you know, like he was unsuccessful, like he would try really hard but never quite achieve any success. Like all of his inventions would eventually break, and he so, was barely scraping by. So I do. So yeah, I do see that. I guess I saw it. I saw it as more that kind of old school um, role that um, dads kind of played. Dads have always been kind of portrayed in this kind of dopey sense. I mean, the kind of the Homer Simpson-esque style. And so I basically just kind of chopped it up to that. But I mean, yeah, you, you would very well be right too. That could be part of that progressive ideology that was uh, interjected into it. But I will tell you this much that everybody out there, every man out there should try to find a wife like he had because that lady, she tried her damnedest to, to use all his inventions and even whenever they were talking about the coffee and stuff and, and she's like, we can't drink this. And it, he's like, why not? And she's laughing about it and stuff too. I mean, that, I mean, we all should be uh, in pursuit of finding a woman that cares about our, <laughs> our, our uh, ventures as much as that woman did, because that's, you know, that's a hard one to find. I will give you that one. I will give you that for sure. And I just have two more comments. Then I'll go to Robert. Um, the other thing that my whole Western culture thing, and I don't know why this is like a big deal for me right now, but because Rand apologized at the end for buying the Mogwai, even though it was the grandson who went against the grandfather's wishes, but the, uh, the grandfather, the, the Chinese grandfather guy was basically saying, you're not ready because you don't respect the environment. Like you trash things like you trash the earth. So there was definitely this 
watermelon message at the end, you know, like Western man is bad because all this progress comes at the expense of the environment. So this is like the proto Greta, you know, time person of the year type stuff. Uh, and then the, um, the, the wife, yes, I agree. she did support her husband in using the inventions and, um, not seemingly, you know, being too upset about barely scraping by and all of that. Uh, and they definitely made her pretty badass when it came to fighting the gremlins. Like, he took out three or four of them um, before the uh, the sun showed up and helped her get out from under that Christmas tree. So, you know, it wasn't like the typical, woe is me, poor woman, oh, she's going to get killed right away. Like, she ground up one of them in a blender and stabbed another with a knife and i guess that scene was going to be even worse where the gremlin was going to pull the knife out of itself and then attack her with it and cut her head off which she put one in a microwave too and that just exploded yeah yeah so you know she was pretty badass uh in that respect so she's like uh that might have been kennedy's influence because that's what she's doing in all these uh, star wars remakes is making the the woman like this amazing hero no training whatsoever and just down with the force right away Anyway, uh, I've been rambling for a little bit. I'll go to Robert. Um, wh what do you think about anything I've said? And then uh, interject your own, your own stuff here. Well, I certainly not. I mean, now that you mention it, I guess I could see your viewpoint saying that this movie is really just a trash against Western culture. Um, I mean, if you pick out a few scenes and talk about it, I mean, there is the, the old lady who is just the miserly woman that won't, allow this lady to keep living rent free or whatever and she's yeah, just she, heartless on christmas eve and whatever she's mr potter from it's wonderful life which we'll talk about next week with mike c and she even named her cats after money like after different names for money like they they laid it on pretty thick in this one actually since it is a christmas movie she played the role of scrooge yeah that's what i saw i saw her as scrooge for sure um, and, uh, I mean, it's, I don't know, I don't know the messaging behind having the excesses of capitalism, being these little gremlin guys killing her. I guess it's like fitting that, that the, the, the evil capitalist lady is killed by the excesses of Western capitalism. I, I don't know. Um, and then you've got. I, I'm just trying to put it all together. I mean, you got the inventor guy who it, it, I expected his inventions to play a part, a bigger part in defeating the gremlins because the whole movie is really like his inventions play a way bigger part than I thought they would be. And then they just kind of nothing happens with them. Like he, we spend a lot of time learning about his bathroom buddy and his smokeless ashtray and his various kitchen appliance things. But yeah, we never, nothing really comes of him other than he's away on Christmas Eve at a convention. <laughs> I don't know who the scheduler of that convention was, but not even an atheist convention would take place on Christmas Eve. I'm telling you this right now. Like, no one would schedule one for the travel inconvenience alone, let alone the religious implications. It just wouldn't although, happen. So, although I will say it looked, it looked more like a, uh, it looked more like a libertarian convention than it did an inventor collection that was pretty weird. Yeah, you had all kinds of stuff going on. <laughs> it's pretty fun, but and I still don't know how he got home like that same night. Uh, whatever the magic of Hollywood, <laughs> I suppose. But at one point he's at this convention and then the next, you know, an hour later, movie time, he's home. But okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, what do you, Rocky, do you, do, you, do you see yourself agreeing with Daniel here? I mean. I, I think it's I, the same kind of, I think it's the same kind of stretch that somebody on the left would try to use in order to try to make a movie about some sort of social justice warrior kind of stuff. I mean, that nowadays is more prevalent, but I think it's a, I think it's a, a really big stretch. Um, but of course we also tend to, 
we also tend to project things that we're currently thinking about onto other things that we see. So, I mean, if, if you've been caught yeah. up with the whole idea of, of Western culture being, you know, shit on recently, then, then, I mean, yeah, I could definitely see how, how that could be projected onto this movie, but to say that they, to say that they created these different aspects and these different characters and played them this way in order to make that statement. Um, I think it's too, um, too subliminal for really anybody to pick up on. Um, kind of like, yeah, almost like playing, you know, uh, satanic messages backwards on, uh, uh, on LP records. It's just not, I just don't think that that's a, that it's a, I think it's too much of a stretch for it to be what. Yeah, Daniel, know. do you think it's intentional by Chris Columbus and the producers? Or do you think that this is like an accidental useful idiot kind of thing where they're just, this is what they're exposed to. This is what they see. So this is what they're repeating sort of thing. Well, I mean, going by who these people are and what they're still doing today, I, I see this as early activism on their part. And maybe they're just playing into tropes and just trying to be funny or entertaining or whatever. But they're certainly taking whatever stereotypes there are about money and profit and capitalists being bad. I mean, they're the villains in this. Um, you know, we talk about <clears throat> Mrs. Deagle, right? That was her name. She says no support to deadbeats. And it's like this woman and her kids and she can't quite pay her rent or her mortgage. It's probably a mortgage, right? Cause it's related to a bank where Billy works. Um, and there's actually in recent news in Seattle, they're talking about, having a new law where you can't evict people for the coldest six months of the year. That, that's already a law in Alaska. Yeah, that's crazy. So, so and, basically and in, you're saying only, you only have to pay half the time. And, and in Alaska, you also, um, if somebody is, uh, if somebody has technically moved in with you or claims your place as residence or has like 50% of their stuff there, I can't remember exactly what the, the technical law is. Um, you can't actually kick them out even if they're not on release. Yeah, and that's also the case with, uh, it's not as big of a deal, I suppose, but it's also, you, you can't turn off somebody's electricity even if they haven't been paying it for yeah, actually, months and months and months and months and months it, during the coldest just, part of the year. Just today, I actually, because I, I just bought a house and moved into a and moved into the house and I thought my wife got everything, all the uh, utilities changed over, and she wound up not getting the, uh, the gas changed over. So I showed up today from picking up my new dishwasher, and I had this, this sign on my uh, house that said that my gas has been turned off. And, and so I called the gas company, and, and they're, like, they're like, okay, well, you got kids. we we'll got somebody right out there. But then they tried to tell me that, they're like, oh, well, if we get somebody out there after hours, it's going to be a $40 extra charge. And so I, I lost it on the guy. I won't go into the whole thing, but I basically told him that um, he's basically trying to uh, shaft me on a price because uh, he because their company has a, a monopoly on uh, on the gas. You know, I'm like, what the hell do you want me to do, man? Go outside and like, you know, sleep next to a campfire like, you know, this, you know, it's freaking cold outside. Tell your guy to get his ass over here and turn my gas back on. Anyway, we went back and forth for a few minutes. And uh, before I. Before I could get into the shower, after I got off the phone, uh, my wife came downstairs and told me that the uh, the gas person was there turning my shit back on. So apparently he got on the horn and has sent him right back over. So. All right, you have a way with words, Rocky. Well, I'll tell you what, man. I, it's just one of those things where it's like, man, dude, like, what are you, what the hell are you trying to do to me, man? You're trying to, you know, just. Be, I told him, I said, where the hell else am I going to go? Can I go to the next gas company and tell them to come over here and turn some gas on because you guys are being a bunch of assholes? And he's like, well, no. Uh, yeah, exactly, no. So tell your guy to get his ass over here and turn my gas back on. You know what I mean? So, I don't know. Anyways. So I, that was a little, a little side trip. But yes, yeah, that no, no, that's, that's what we like here. We like rambling uh, <laughs> side stories. We like to go off on tangents. Uh, you know, the other thing about Miss Deagle is they made her worse than Michael Vick when it comes to the treatment of animals. <laughs> you know, like... He, the little dog, I forget his uh, his name in the movie, but he was the, the dog actor was named Mushroom, like the actual dog's name was Mushroom. And I guess he had chewed up one of her snowmen. And so she wanted to kill the dog. She went to Billy's place of employment at the bank, which, by the way, was three blocks away from where he lived. 
and he was going to try to drive there in his piece of crap foreign car. But because <laughs> it didn't start, he had to walk. And, you know, if it had worked and he had driven there, Greta would have been pissed. But uh, <laughs> so she goes to his work, threatens him and says, I don't want you to pay for the damages. I want your dog so I can kill him slowly and torture him. And that was terrible. She said it was very Cruella Cruel Deville. Yeah, she was going to put him in dryer on like high. And the guy next to her was like, that'll do it. <laughs> so, I mean, you couldn't make this woman more evil. So I, I defend my thesis that they are going out of their way to paint the capitalist in the worst possible light in this film. I still think it has to do with her playing a Scrooge, a, a Scrooge, uh, kind of the, the bah humbug person, but uh, just to a different extent. I don't think it has to do with it. I, I mean, I guess you could almost say that Scrooge, Scrooge is a, is a portrayal of like an evil capitalist. So by that nature, then she therefore would be an evil capitalist. But I would say that she was more of a, yeah, we're we're losing. Yeah, I, but. We're losing Rocky here, but um, yeah, I would I would agree with um, Daniel that the the evil capitalist, in terms of the lady, is a stronger argument than necessarily the the bumbling dad who the entrepreneur who unwittingly you know destroys the town. Uh, what are some other movies? I want to say that there's other movies that kind of follow the same line where there's, you know, dumb American doesn't understand the East or the world and bumbles around destroying things. It sounds like a familiar theme, but nothing's jumping to mind. I mean, there's big trouble in little China, but, but Jack's actually pretty badass in that one. Kurt Russell character. Yeah. All the humans came off really, really bad in this movie. They just all look terrible. They all look pathetic against these little puppets. Like they take their time when they they know ahead of time what the the weaknesses are. They're they're, they're laid out ahead of time, like light. So grab a flashlight and shine it at something if it's scaring you. I don't know. Yeah, and the you know the other side of this movie in watching it, I was like it seemed rather aimless. Like why are, why is he doing this now? Why is he going over there? Why is Gizmo driving this little pink car just randomly around the store? Like, yeah. I had the same problem with you that especially during the climax of the film, it wasn't clear since you're dealing with puppets and you're in a limited space and they can't really show a chase scene or whatever. Like where's the, the tension? Where's the drama? We don't know. We don't know this, this. You know the the difficulty Gizmo is having to get to save the day. Like all we see is him just driving around. We don't know if he's trying to find them. If he's having to avoid obstacles. All we see is just him tooling around. There's no drama. And then the puppets aren't scary. So every time there's a puppet attacking a human or whatever it's like okay really i don't believe it and i can suspend disbelief to a certain extent but it's really hard when a muppet is attacking a human to really be afraid for the human even if i care about the character which i really didn't in this movie i mean the main character is kind of mr Faceless, nameless guy. I, don't, I, I honestly don't know his name. Maybe Billy? Maybe? Billy, it was yeah. Billy, yeah. Um, the girl, I kind of liked. I thought they were going to get into that romance a little bit. It seemed like they were going to do that. Felt a little And forked. then they set up the Cruella de Vil lady as the big villain. But then, of course, it's the Gremlins who's the villain. So, I don't know. The narrative of this movie is all kind of over the shop. And there really wasn't tension like you were just talking daniel i the climax especially is just people just kind of rolling around doing stuff the, the weakest part of the climax was whenever uh she tried to get him with the uh, uh chainsaw and he wound up holding him off with a wooden baseball bat yep that was pretty funny 
like <laughs> pathetically <pretty> funny. <laughs> that was pretty weak, but you know, hey, it is what it is. And, it's and then there's 80s. multiple times, multiple times where gremlins have guns and they still can't yeah. kill a human. Yeah, they're shooting like stormtroopers. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, uh, to, to kind of uh, go off what you were talking about with uh, Gizmo driving that car, that's a very 80s-esque style thing for uh, for a little person to drive a remote control car as if it was a real car. Yeah, they do that like Stuart Little and Honey, I Shrunk the Kids and probably something else. Inner Space. Mac and Me, I think. Remember Mac and Me? Not at all, but I'm sure it's, it's like something. <laughs> I think it's like the uh, the Seven Up version of ET or something like that. I forget. Oh yeah, now that you mentioned, yeah, an alien movie. Yeah, yeah. So there, it's kind of like also, Short Circuit. Yeah. Yeah, kind of more like ET. Like kid finds an alien. Alien loves to drink Seven Up instead of or eating Mr. Pib or pieces. Something. You know, it's just. <laughs> Product placement, but yeah, well, it's in, terrible. In they they like milk duds. Apparently, the uh, the gremlins do. They keep saying milk duds, milk duds. Yeah. When they're in the theater, that gets blown up. By the way, that whole oh. um, town square is the same town square from Back to the Future. It looks it? like it. I didn't know it oh. was, but it looked like the same set, just covered in snow or fake yeah. snow. Same set, and it is fake snow. Yeah, there's actually so, snow underneath the branches because they have <laughs> sprayed it like from underneath. All right, go ahead, Rocky. No, I, I wanted to comment on the uh, on uh, their um, language skills because it's absurd that they like they're just like like well they what they uh, are kind of born through like my, my, uh, mitosis or some crap and they just like spontaneously arrive based on water and, and that kind of far fetched idea. But whenever they come alive, like they know words and can formulate like broken sentences, but nobody taught them the words. And they know almost all English except for one Spanish word, which is caca, which means shit. And everything is caca to them. So if they want to say something shit, they say it's caca, the only Spanish word they know. And then the rest of the time they speak like these English words that they, that I don't know where they would have learned these words. So are the words inherently like just there or what? Yeah, that, that's actually a few levels like further in than I even want to go. Like, based on <laughs> level stuff, let's talk about these rules for a second. They make no sense whatsoever. Thank you, especially <laughs> the one about after midnight. After yes. midnight, where? Yes. And what time of year? Because the government dictates that the time changes on a whim, you know, by decree. So. What also, if, since I came from a Chinese man, is it on Chinese after midnight or American after midnight? And yeah, when does yeah. the top reset? If it's after midnight, does it reset at three o'clock in the morning? What is the window? If you're on an if you're on an international dateline, you know, can you move? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Like... Yeah, and you know, Rocky, you're driving a truck right now. I mean, you're in a state that has two time zones. So if you go too far, you know, you better. I Stop feeding that gremlin. <laughs> yeah, pizza's okay right here, but it's not okay there. Yeah. Yeah. Now the other thing is getting them wet to somehow spontaneously create another version of it. Talk about solving world hunger. I mean, you could be running <laughs> rabbit farms of these little mogwai. I'm sure they're delicious. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm sure Greta doesn't like that either. But it seems yeah, like they have to take factory farming to a whole new level. <laughs> yeah. Could, um, I wonder. I wonder how much it actually hurts because it looks like it's very painful. And so, and th does that also mean that there's a lot of seeds within them? So, like they they, they naturally have like all these seeds, and when they get wet, like the seeds kind of pop out because you haven't run out of seeds. Because whenever Stripe jumped in the water, there was a shit ton of them that came out. Did he run out, or did, does the more water equal the more? Because whenever he puts the one drop on him, you only got one. The spilled water created like six, and then there was like I don't know, seventy-five or whatever. Whenever he jumped in the pool, yeah, whole gang, yeah, yeah. they took whole, over the town. The whole movie theater full. I think you're poking holes in this masterpiece here, Rocky. <laughs> no, no, hey, hey, I, it's not a perfect movie. It's the best Christmas movie. Those are two different things. 
Okay, can I briefly complain about the realism? I know it, <laughs> it makes no sense to do this. I'll, I'll say, but, a movie called Gremlins, you're going to complain about the Right, realism. I know. It's ridiculous. This whole thing is ridiculous. <laughs> the show's ridiculous. The movie's ridiculous. I'm being ridiculous right now. <laughs> so it's, yeah, Inception, ridiculous. But it's a, it looks like a mammal. Mogwai looks like a mammal, and then the gremlins look like reptiles. I, I don't know of any mammal that can survive without water, like taking on water. It's made of water. It's probably two-thirds water. So I don't understand how water touching it causes it to spontaneously multiply. It makes no sense. And then to – I mean, I like the idea of the – um from like a horror movie and they turn into like little alien eggs and then they pupate and whatever and they transform. It's fine. But to go from this cute little mogwai to a reptile, I, I don't know. I, I, It's fine on one level because it's just a dumb movie and who cares? But then if you actually think about it, which I, I don't know why I'm thinking about it. Why do I care? I don't know. Well, there's a correction. There's a correction there actually, because whenever they get when they get wet, they don't turn into the eggs. It's whenever they eat, they actually turn into the eggs. But what's really weird is whenever they've already become a gremlin, when they get wet, they don't create mogwais. When they're a gremlin and they get wet, they create other gremlins. But when it's a mogwai and it gets wet, it creates other mogwais. But in order for the mogwai to turn into the gremlin, it has to eat after midnight, or whatever the, the time frame. Yeah, it's like the rules are just arbitrary, and they're just like, well, we need to have some mechanism for the film, but it doesn't really matter what it is. We're just going to do funny stuff with the montages in the bar scene and in the movie theater. That's yeah, yeah, the yeah. Of the movie. That's all this movie <laughs> is. Because otherwise, there's it... no narrative. What was this? <laughs> so it needs to be, man. It just needs to be a, 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 a horror holiday, a, a comedy horror holiday movie. I think, I think I do. I do think there's potential in this idea. I think it could be remade today, or maybe in ten, twenty years, or whatever, and it oh, could sorry, actually be done well. Remake? I'm pitching a remake right now. I think the idea is pretty decent. Of, you know, there's that cool uh, uh, Twilight Zone episode where there's the gremlin on the side of the plane. That's a terrifying episode. I mean, I, back when I saw it when I was a kid, yeah, if you look yeah. out a plane window and you see something tearing apart the engine, that's fucking, <laughs> you're going to shit yourself. Didn't Simpsons do a play on that for a Halloween episode? Uh, probably a couple of times, yeah. Yeah, they did a, the, some sort of creature outside the bus and Bart Simpson kept seeing it or something like that. Yeah, it's, anyway. it's a good theme. It's a good idea. Um, I think this movie, yeah, I think it, they went a different direction, which I think it didn't work for me. It obviously worked for you, Rocky. It's fine. I, I love it. <laughs> you know, I feel like they really didn't have uh, a real coherent story, and they were just shooting a bunch of footage and thinking that, oh, this will be funny, this will be funny, this will be funny, let's fit all this in. The original cut for this was, I think, almost three hours long. And they were still <laughs> doing rewrites uh, you know, while they were shooting, if I if I I'd read watch it, it. I'd watch three hours of it, no doubt. I'd be there. <laughs> this this was Don't a long hour, hour and forty five minutes for me watching this. <laughs> this this is the cut down, edited, tightly scripted version. This is a meandering, just whatever. What's the narrative weight of this film? Yeah, I mean, oh, yeah, there, there's there's definitely no there's definitely not much of a character arc. I mean, other than other than the uh, the the one the main character kissing the girl at the end. I will say this: in order in order to draw more lines for it being a Christmas movie, is the guy Gerald, and there actually was the um, stepdad in the Santa Claus. Okay, did you that know guy that guy who was the bank manager? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know the mom. Yeah, was, the mom was the mom in um, Back to the Future. Lorraine's mom. Oh, mm -hmm. really? That's true. Hmm. I thought yeah. I recognized her from somewhere. I think they were shot back to back, like right around the same same year or two there. 
Well, can we can we go back to his inventions a little bit? Because yep. like in Back to the Future, you see a lot of things that actually kind of foretold events in the future, like inventions that actually did happen. And I think a few of the inventions that are displayed by Rand here actually do end up showing up in the future. You got a like, bathroom buddy? Do you have a bathroom buddy, Dan? I do have a bathroom buddy. <laughs> uh, That's, that sounds a lot dirtier than it probably is. His name is Gerald. He comes on Tuesdays. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's in a bunny suit. Uh, uh, so the coffee machine, it reminded me of the present day Nespresso machine. Granted, it doesn't have the sludge come out, but it, it, it looked like it. And then I think I've seen a smokeless ashtray like in a sharper image catalog a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah. Or, or it looks yeah, kind of like a Keurig, what a Keurig would be today. Yeah. And then yeah, and there was a juicer that, yeah, that mysteriously juicer. had way more juice than a half of an orange could actually ever have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, maybe, yeah. Maybe it got the orange wet and it multiplied inside the machine. <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, the the uh, um, Corey Feldman line related to that juicer reminded me of you and your sign making efforts, Robert. Mm. Where he said, "You know, orange juice in cartons is a lot easier." Like. Rely on the division of labor specialization. Somebody's already figured out how to get orange juice to a consumer quickly and easily and efficiently. Right. Yeah. You don't have to do it yourself, even with this newfangled, you know, technology, this machine. You guys, you guys are talking about what that little kid said, right? About, yeah. Yeah. About, yeah. Peter. yeah. That's a I young thought, Corey I, Feldman. I thought that that was, I thought it was, well, when I first saw him walk in the house, I was like, well, I, I was like, I don't know why the hell this little kid that's bringing a Christmas tree over is just walking into this dude's house. And then I, and then I, later on, you find out that these guys are friends. And I'm like, what the hell is this like 21 year old doing hanging out with this 13 year old? And then whenever they're at the school with the professor, I'm like, this dude has a really weird set of friends. He has this like racist neighbor that he's chummed up with. And then he has like this girl who's kind of this weird, like I work for free at bars to help out. And then he's hanging out with this child at the same time that he's hanging out with his, uh, his teacher from school. And I'm like, this guy is like world is like set up with all these like weird caricatures of, of people out there. Anyways, it was just kind of weird. His, he was definitely a loser. His, his circle of friends was very bizarre. Wow. So you just described Robert like 20 years ago. <laughs> and today. <laughs> I hang yeah. out with people of all ages, man. I mean, I don't. You know, the youngest equal? kid I see is my nephew, this, this, who's, who's eleven. But yeah, he's an equal opportunity hanger out Yeah, I was about to say I'm you better be discriminate. What you say on there. Actually, I discriminate all the time. People I hang out with are cool. All right. All right. So, <laughs> make your case, Rocky, why this is better. Or more Christmassy than Die Hard because Die Hard's pretty Christmassy. I mean, the whole events take place at a Christmas party. Okay, just because it takes place at a Christmas party does not mean that it's. I never said that it wasn't a a Christmas movie. Die Hard is a Christmas movie. It's just I just don't think that it's as good of a Christmas movie as Gremlins. Now I mean, wait a it's minute. Much, it's a much better it's movie like, though. Yeah, okay. are you splitting right. hairs here, Rocky? Like, is it okay, a better so, movie or a better Christmas movie? Like a, a more think, Christmassy movie. Well, the one thing, the one thing about it is that you're taking genres, two different genres. You're taking an action holiday movie and trying to compare it to a comedy holiday movie. But you these, but they, am, motherfucker. <laughs> but no, what 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 I think what I think I find more appealing about Gremlins versus Die Hard. And I, I let, let's let me caveat one thing. I absolutely hate Bruce Willis. I hate Bruce Willis to the point that I think Bruce Willis almost fucked up Pulp Fiction. Um, I absolutely despise everything about Bruce Willis. So everything he's ever done. Said, uh, I don't or know. Have you mostly they, hated him lately. No, basically everything he's done. Okay. I, I don't like. I don't like his acting at all. I don't like him as an individual. I don't like it. So there, there, my bias probably lays lays in there. So that's, that's like Robert and me and and Ben and Affleck, like we talked about in uh, last week's episode. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ben Affleck's not I, not my, my favorite either. Anyways, I I think that Gremlins is a much more entertaining movie. Maybe because I I see it for what for what it is. It's just supposed to be this goofy ass comedy. It's 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 labeled comedy horror because you have this this creature that would be considered like a like a horror like creature like Gremlins, and it, but it's not really a horror movie in that it's more like a comedy and it's set in. And, and at Christmas time, but everything, all the events around this is actually is actually talking about Christmas. I mean, the Mogwai was a gift for Christmas. The dad's out there trying to sell his inventions and stuff. I, I believe he was saying something like he needed money. He was trying to uh, get money for Christmas. The whole thing is about the whole thing is about Christmas. The setting is not just Christmas, but the whole movie is taking place around uh, uh, Christmas time and around. Uh, 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 like the lady comes up and wants to get the extension on a mortgage or whatever because it's it's Christmas time and they're trying to buy presents or whatever. The whole, every everything about this movie has to do with Christmas. So therefore, it is a it is more of a Christmas movie than than Die Hard. But not only that, but I also just think it's a more entertaining movie than Die Hard, and it's more entertaining Christmas. So therefore, it's a more entertaining Christmas movie than Die Hard. Okay. Making the it's a better movie argument, Robert. Yeah, he is making the it's a better movie argument, which is kind of blasphemous. Uh, it offends my <laughs> sensibilities. Now, I think you're also are you you're act, you're kind of talking like Die Hard and Gremlins are like the one and two, but I would. It sounds like you're really trashing Die Hard pretty hard, and maybe you would have something like I don't know a Christmas Story up higher. Is that the case? <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know what my top. I don't know what my my top five would be. I mean, I uh, I I think what makes Die Hard more of a Christmas movie is this this stigma where people have fought about whether or not Die Hard is or is not a Christmas movie. So therefore, it now has the uh, appeal that it's more of a Christmas movie than it actually is. So that's why I t that's why I say. Die Hard is a Christmas movie. I just don't think it is the best Christmas movie. Okay. All right. Are you going to let that stand, Daniel? Are you let him get away with that? Are you going to let him <laughs> well, talk to you like that? I'm going to agree to disagree with him on this one. I think Die Hard is, is a great Christmas movie, and it's a great movie just overall. And uh, we, we did an episode of that with our guest, uh, Shaheen, a couple of years ago. So we'll put that on our show page at last night. Like, where you can find kind of show us more for this particular episode with Rocky talking about uh, Baby Yoda, or a bunch of Baby Yodas turning into reptilian monsters. Um, so speaking of Christmas stories, and the Phoebe Cates character, she has this monologue about why she doesn't believe in Christmas. And for a comedy horror film, I found that to stand out as like not quite... Like it stood out because it, it, it was felt out of place, but it gave it some weight and some gravity. And I thought it was actually really good as far as like, hey, we're going to throw a curveball in this movie here. This uh, movie 100%. where we had this crazy, you know, stuff at the bar scene that, you know, tells me that the mid 80s cocaine is a hell of a drug. Um, but yeah, having TV Cates do this uh, monologue just came out of left field and was a welcome respite from just the inanity. That the rest of the film seemed to be. Yeah, the it, it was definitely the different shit. than the rest of the movie. It, but it was actually, it was actually as far as like cinema, like as far as like an actual movie and and being more of like a critic of a movie. It was, it was certainly the yeah, like you said, the standout scene. It was the best scene, acting wise. It was the best scene of the. Movie. Yes, I would agree with that. Although the way that this movie is so all over the shop. It, it really does kind of stick out like a sore thumb. Not, and, it, and you could say it's the best scene in the movie, but then you got to ask yourself, well, why weren't there more scenes like that in this movie? Like, or why, why is that here? And then the rest of it is this other stuff. It's like they're just like throwing everything they can at the screen and trying to form some sort of a narrative out of it. I don't know. Now I never knew there was three hours. I never knew there was the original cut was three hours. Like I said, I'd be interested to see what that what that movie looked like and how in comparison to how they cut it down because there could be a lot more scenes 
like that in the movie, um, in the original cut. And uh, for whatever reason, I don't know why they would choose to cut it the way they did. But obviously, you know, they could have chose to cut cut a lot of that stuff out. There could be a lot more of it up that ran up on the, the cutting room floor. So I'm not sure why, but there, what I'm saying is that there could be more of that. So it could, so it might not be that they filmed all this stuff that's funny and, and off the wall and, and, you know, out of whack and everything. And then they just were like, Hey, let's film this one scene. There could have been a lot more of that. And then why they didn't include it would be the actual real question. Yeah. yeah. There's any way to see that cut. Um, because that, that was like the the rough cut before they went into editing for creating the theatrical release. But I guess yeah. the original story, Gizmo was supposed to become a gremlin. But then Spielberg was like, no, I think the audience is going to want to see Gizmo like survive. He's cute and people are going to want him to make it through to the end of the movie and, and him actually be the hero just kind of randomly without actually doing anything in particular other than driving a little car around aimlessly. Uh, <laughs> I want to know why every gremlin is bad except for Gizmo. Even the Mogwais are bad. So if gremlin, so if Gizmo became a gremlin, would he still be a good gremlin? Yeah, it seems to be that all the other ones were bad even before they became gremlins. Like they were the ones who c cut through the uh, the wires in the alarm clock to leave it on before midnight. Yep. And are they, I mean, are they, so they must be self-aware that if they eat after midnight and this is uh, th that they'll turn into gremlins. And then they also have to be able to tell time, which is another thing that I guess gremlins are just innately born with the ability to be able to tell time and count and just kind of like they're innately born with a handful of, uh, of words that they know. And they innately want to turn into gremlins. Like they have some yeah. sort of drive to be gremlins like there's something they can't do until they become gremlins but it looks i mean what do they gain like a reptilian a body want to. a little bit taller yeah why why does uh, only why do only some of them want to be are is that are they trying to say that gremlins are just born bad some mogwai are just born bad when I mean, they did string up the dog and that was when they were still mogwai and that was just to distract Billy to get him out of the room so they could I want to know how they did that <laughs> I want to know how those little tiny ass mogwai strung up the dog. Well, it's the '80s. A lot of stuff happens off screen. You just got to leave it to your imagination <laughs> because they didn't have the technical ability to do that. <laughs> well, and then and then you have Gizmo driving a remote control car as if it was a real one. So I mean, you just gotta yeah, you gotta just gotta use your imagination a little bit. You just got a little steering wheel in there. Come on, <laughs> <laughs> it's really a track connected to a real drivetrain. You know how it is. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know how those Barbie cars are. <laughs> yeah, they're not just plastic. <clears throat> so, yeah, yeah. Not, what else to say on this one? Um, I feel like Robert and I, we've, we've been combining our efforts in trashing this, and uh, Rocky's been, you know, admirably uh, steadfastly holding true, even though he's lost an arm and a leg. And, um, but, you know, he's still like the Black Knight, willing to fight on, not admit that's that. right. It just, is just I, a flesh I, wound. Also, I do got a question. So, are they are they are uh, Mogwai genderless because they don't have to reproduce through having sex? So, are they like? Yeah, they're definitely you know. asexual. It looks like that's another foretelling of of the future. Mm, right? Do they have kind of boy and girl yeah. bones or not? You know. Well, one of them was a girl, right? In that bar scene, or was it just a boy gremlin? identifying as a female gremlin oh the world may never know and did you notice yeah. the um the uh flasher gremlin like wearing the trench coat yes yeah yeah there was no like bits I don't know. <laughs> no, not even. No you're bits. smooth like a ken doll what are you flashing i don't know <laughs> yeah robert you got disappointed on that one huh yeah yeah it was, that was <laughs> let down a little bit yeah all right, so <laughs> I think we're gonna need to start winding this one down a little bit. Um, I think I had like one or two other points I, to make. I got one. I got one more thing about these cops. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to talk about the cops. Yeah, exactly. Okay, go for it. Looking for a handout. Oh, we lost Rocky. Well, join us again, my friend, and we'll talk about 
the cops. So yeah, at the, at the opening scene, Robert, you're the alluded. beggar cops. Yeah. Yeah. So the it, cops yeah, go come ahead. over to the, uh, the food, the tree stand. And they're like, Hey, can you spare one of these for the station or whatever? The boys down at the station. Boys down at the station. Cause, cause you know, we, we can't actually pay for one out of our own pocket. I mean, even though it's your own tax dollars coming back to you. And then, uh, what is it? The guy behind him's like, "Hey, I had to pay for mine." It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, "Hey, Frank, I, I paid for mine," you know. And I don't know, was that guy like the mayor of the town or something like that? The guy who said he paid for his own? I couldn't tell you. All right. Well, I don't the- know, but then they they got drunk at the station. They were drinking uh, alcoholic eggnog, and then they went driving while they were drunk uh, because the guy that was getting drunk with the sheriff and he's like, "Hey, can I drive?" And then he's like. He's like, no, you can't. He's like, why do you get to drive? And he's like, because I'm the sheriff. And then whenever they were driving around and they saw all the gremlins and stuff attacking people, they did the typical thing that the cops would do, kind of like that one cop uh, whenever the uh, school shooting was going on and he didn't go in there and do anything. Uh, they see all these gremlins attacking people. And the one cop's like, oh, we're going to go back to the station. So, you know. Yeah, yeah. They were making fun of the guy who was getting eaten alive, dressed as Santa. Uh, yeah, see, so there was some realism. There's some realism here. Yeah, I'm surprised they didn't <laughs> okay. use the human shield. <laughs> well, uh, the cops did get truck. Run away. <laughs> they were like scared and they ran away. <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. Terrible. Uh, All right, one last <clears throat> thing on Mrs. Deagle. Um, one of the early scenes, they say Mrs. Deagle's so terrible, she's trying to shut down this bar. So we want to sign this petition to use the force of government to decree that the bar is now a historical site and needs to be preserved, thus preventing capital improvement of this dive bar that is a blight on the community. Your take, Well, Robert. it's still being patronized. still being patronized. But yeah, I mean, if, if, if the public actually wanted to preserve this bar, they would patronize it, and then they would have enough money to maintain the thing. And then Mrs. Deagle wouldn't be able to shut it down. She's probably shutting it down because it doesn't make enough money. That's how, I mean, capital, you know, there is creative destruction when things get replaced with better things. Yeah, now, if, if the case, public. I think it was a mismanagement of the bar because there's even a ton of patients, but they were getting extended credit and not paying for what they're drinking. And uh, the. Um, owner of the bar when phoebe case was working there he's like oh yeah the guy's playing pool over there on the house for them so he wasn't even charging people like he must have had this aversion to making a profit because profits equal bad according to the logic of the movie and so therefore he's not competently running his business and that's why it's failing and subject to being bought out by mrs deagle and replaced by something with uh, actual capital improvement Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think you're reading into it a little bit, probably, but the movie doesn't give us enough for this detail that we're attacking. But yeah, that's a lot of times that's what happens. People try to call some old thing special or for whatever reason, you know, it's special to them, but they don't want to go to the effort to get them capital together to actually purchase the place they want to petition government to come in and use force to say no this is a special piece of property and we're not going to do anything else to it and we're going to preserve it as is because these this special interest group has greased our wheels and that's what we're going to do that's that happens all the time yeah and god forbid you try to actually purchase uh, a structure that is under one of these designations and do anything with that structure. Oh, you'll get a mob. Oh yeah. And and all these uh, hoops and regulations and permits. I mean, you try to watch any of these shows. They got a bunch of them on Netflix about, um, uh, they're like usually from England and they're about like evicting people from your property or buying property. You have to get all this planning commission approvals and all this stuff. It's ridiculous. Like just to do anything. Um, you have to get so many different levels of approval, all very costly, all very time consuming rather than just being able to 
properly own something and maintain control of it and do what you wish as long as you're not harming another. It's and uh, that's just one end of the regulations, not to mention all the different building codes and you can't use these light bulbs and you have to use this level of flashing on X number of things. And that all stuff contributes to the price of real estate and housing. Right. Indeed. And there's a million, million different ways government fucks up the market. And then blames the market, which is like the, the greatest thing ever. Like they can always have a program that screws something up and then not take the blame for it was their program. They did it. They can say it's a market failure. Oh, yeah. They restrict the market every which way and then say that, well, they're just they're benevolent government. They didn't do anything wrong. All right. But I think yeah, I think we've uh, we've, we should be wrapping this one up, Daniel. Um, I'll go first in my scoring, if you don't mind. I'd love I'd love for you to open this out. All right. So. I think my main problem with this film and the reason why I kind of lost interest about halfway through or three quarters of the way through is the first half actually has some kind of narration. So one scene ends and the next scene kind of takes off from where that first scene ended. That's kind of like a narrative. And then right around the time when the gremlins uh, stripe, he jumps in the pool and makes infinity of himself, like all kinds of Pokemons just running around the town. <laughs> then it's like they didn't know what to do, like in terms of a story. So they just kind of threw a bunch of just gremlins doing different shit. And I think a big problem is, is that you could take those scenes and rearrange them any which way. And it's the same story because one scene doesn't feed into the next. So there's no narrative and up until up until Stripe dies from when he multiplies it, those scenes are all pretty much interchangeable. And as an audience, I'm sitting there going, okay, what am I supposed to be following? How is this? Anyway, it, it's just a big old mess. And uh, yeah, I didn't uh, much care for it. I, I think it's a decent, if you go in thinking it's just going to be some silly thing, it's definitely that. Um it's a Christmas movie. Um, if you want just some silly Christmas movie, and I know we've had guests on that have very low standards for films. <laughs> and that's great. That's, that's not great. me. There's... Are you implying something? <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not talking about you, Rocky. I'm talking about we've had some guests on, some guests, you know, those people, who would just watch any old piece of crap. But the thing is, we have to watch like a lot of movies. And when you watch a lot of movies, you get kind of discerning because you're like, I've seen this done better 20 times. I've seen this movie way better. I've seen that done better. I've seen, you know, you just on the back of your head, you're not necessarily thinking about it all the time, but you're like, this is not up to muster. And so we have higher standards just naturally. And this movie is, yeah, below average. I'm sorry, Die Hard is a better movie by far <laughs> i'll give you that maybe this is more of a christmas themed movie it's definitely more christmas themed but i would say something like a christmas story is probably a better christmas movie even though that's not a perfect movie either but i i could watch that over and over again and enjoy it every time um but yeah this thing it's uh i'm gonna give it a four i don't think i don't recommend it if you want something silly to watch that came out in the 80s OK, um, even throwing away Daniel's, you know, analysis of it being a critique of Western civilization. If you just turn your brain off and watch some silliness, you'll be OK. But if you want anything more, I don't think this movie gives it to you. So throwing away any negatives, I don't think it has any positives. OK. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ro Rocky, we'll go to you to to polish this a little bit, throw some positives out there. <laughs> What's your um, I, I think that, um, I think that you made a good point. Um, and I think that's the reason why I like the movie so much, because if you go into it, knowing what it is, 
you can like a movie for what it is. I don't think that this was a movie that was trying to be serious in any way, shape, or form. And so if you try to look at it from like, oh, well, this movie wasn't necessarily serious or it wasn't this horror movie that this thing that like maybe you might think it would be if you were just like uh, reading a description of it or if you saw the uh, VH, you know how they used to have the VHS sleeve with the uh, styrofoam in it if you were picking it up from Blockbuster or something. I mean, if you have this perception going in of it being something else I would definitely say okay then yeah you're probably going to be disappointed if you know what it is and what the movie's trying to be then you grade it from the point of what it's trying to be which is kind of this um, not even it's not even slapstick just this quirky comedy based on this horror idea set in Christmas time it's it's totally off the wall Um, so being for what it is I still would put this movie at an eight. Um, the story does lack, which is why I can't get it higher. Um, there is a lot of stuff that you just kind of have to roll with, um, you know, like the rules for uh, uh, the uh, gremlins, a lot of stuff. It doesn't explain characters are two dimensional. Um, this is, this was just something that this wasn't a huge blockbuster from the eighties even. So you, you know, you got to look at the early eighties or mid eighties, uh, not being a huge um not a huge movie, although it did have Steven Spielberg attached to it and a bunch of other people. But uh, yeah, I think that I think that uh, if you go in there knowing exactly what it is and, and you're going in there to watch what it is, um, yeah, I would stay in eight. Wow! Wow! All right. Well, that's uh, that's high praise, Rocky. And I know that this was a movie that you know, like I said, you had the Facebook post where you're comparing this to Die Hard, and you said that this won out, and that was one of the reasons yep. why when we were talking about having you on again <laughs> to do a movie. Uh, we landed on Gremlins because of that post. So I knew <laughs> yeah, still, it. still no superhero movie. <laughs> yeah, it'll it'll happen, man. It'll happen soon. Although um, last time I last time I also criticized uh, uh, how much you guys shit on uh, Marvel too. So I, it looks like I'm I'm always going to come on having the uh, opposing view. So you know. Well, that's what we need. We need somebody who disagrees <laughs> with us. Uh, and really, you know, you, Robert and I agree a lot, um, pretty often, but there are a couple of standout episodes where we, we butt heads. And I think those are some of our stronger ones. So having, having a third person who can come in and, and bring that level of uh, like antagonistic. Uh, well, that's not the right <laughs> word, but you know, like lighthearted. Yeah, it's lighthearted, but you know, it, it's a little pushback. So we have to like sharpen our arguments a little bit, sharpen, sharpen our criticisms. I think that's, uh, that's, that's admirable. And it, it really helps make it a more interesting conversation. So yeah. we appreciate you for, for bringing that to this one, especially now. Absolutely. <laughs> my review is going to reflect a lot along the same lines with Robert. Um, I felt like this had some promise and it opened pretty well, but then they kind of lost the plot. They kind of lost what they were doing. And it seemed like things were just kind of randomly and haphazardly happening. And I, had, I didn't know why Billy was trying to get in his car to drive across town for whatever reason. I didn't know why they found them at the movie theater and then blew up the movie theater when all they had to do was turn the lights on or why, when the lights of the movie theater, like the projector was hitting the gremlins, it didn't do anything to them. You know, when they tore through the screen. So a lot of internal consistencies weren't really happening here. Um, but it does have that nostalgia for sure. And for that reason, I think that if you haven't seen this in a long time, don't. Just cherish <laughs> the memories you have from watching That's it right. in the past. And just know Leave it be. far worse than you remember. It's definitely geared towards not a whole lot of thought about it. It's definitely geared towards kids of the 80s before, you know, before the kids of the 80s grew up and had their own kids. And they're like, well, I can't have my kids watching super violent stuff. So, like, I'm not sure who today could watch this film. Um, my kids are four and six. They're not going to see this anytime soon. But by the time they're old enough to see it, I think they're going to think it's corny. So I don't know. There's like a, a sweet spot and it's a very narrow one. And I think I happen to be in it in 1985 when I saw this film the first time. So that's my review. I'm going to go. I'm going to match you on the fours, Robert. So combined, our powers combined equal... Rocky's score of eight. <laughs> <laughs> Overall, not so bad. 
And uh, <laughs> apparently I'm on the streak of like just trashy movies because I gave, I think, uh, The Killing Joke last week a four, which is maybe I'm in a mood. I don't know what it is, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've just been watching not good movies. <laughs> Well, next week, I, I am holding out hope that, that it is a better movie than I remember. Because it is a classic. We're going to be doing It's a Wonderful Life. It is a f- you know full-on, full Christmas movie. And that's going to be with our pal Mike C, who's been on numerous occasions. He's a super good dude. And I think that we're going to have a great discussion. And he already knows, Robert, that you are going to dislike it. So he's gonna <laughs> he's looking forward to having that discussion next week. Cool, cool. Yeah, I, it, it's a wonderful life. Is a movie that I think it's my dad's favorite movie of all time. He he had like three VHS copies and then a DVD <laughs> copy, or two, maybe two DVD copies. I think people just keep giving it to him for Christmas, even though they show it on TV or they used to show it on TV. I don't know if they still. I don't even watch TV in ten it's years. It's not so like know, out but. of uh, copyright anymore. <laughs> like it's not just free. <laughs> No, that's why they do show it all the time because it's not copyright. So yeah, um, I don't know. I, I I remember it being incredibly long. I think I've only seen the end, and the end is pretty good, but it's actually an incredibly long movie, and the and the end payoff is brief, and so maybe that's why I have good memories of it. So we'll see. Yeah, well, there is actually a turn, unlike in this film. You know, there's a character arc. There's something that you learn by the end of it. Um, not yes. not like Gremlins here. I don't think I learned anything <laughs> by watching this. But it was you, didn't learn, you didn't even learn how to just sit down and enjoy a quirky movie. <laughs> apparently, <laughs> apparently, I need to go back to school and learn that. Get dumbed out a little bit. You guys watch too many movies, man. You guys can't just sit back and let the stupid flow for a minute, you know? <laughs> It's tough. It really is. It's a hard knock life. Let me tell you, Rocky. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you again for coming on. And I hope you can stick around for a little bit longer. We're going to do some Kathleen Turner Overdrive, which is available for our Patreon supporters. This has been yes, uh, episode 102 of the show. And you can find the show on smart last night slash 102. Also, you can find this on the Launchpad Media, where they're always launching new ideas in your direction. Check it out at launchpadmedia.com. We'll be back next week with it's a Wonderful Life and Mike C. as our guest. If you like what we do here, Robert's got a few uh, brief messages for you before we get into the uh, closing music here. Yeah, we've got a Patreon. You could leave a review on Apple Podcasts. You could leave a like and a subscribe on our YouTube channel. You could go to Trevster.com and buy a t-shirt or a sticker or a poster or a pillow, any kind of gift for, you know, some kind of a Christmassy thing. It might be a little bit too late now, but you can still do it for the new year. Start off the new year fresh. But yeah, that's, that's pretty much why we could do it. Yeah. So uh, subscribe on the old YouTubes uh, where we are now showing live stream video content or, or video captured during live streaming uh, that becomes the show. So now you can see us in all of our old middle-aged man glory uh, talking about movies semi-coherently and usually trashing them here on The Last Nighters. So That's a great you, tagline. It's, uh, you know, we're midwits on movies. That's, that's what could be another tagline. If, if we're throwing taglines around, that could be another one. But uh, Rocky, thank you again for being our guest and uh, do stick around. And we will have links to your website and also your previous appearances on the show notes page for this one. So much appreciated. Thanks again. And uh, we'll say good night from last night, everyone. <laughs>